Hello, everyone. Welcome in live nationwide and around the world to Ron Seji Today, got a big show in store for you the next two hours. My first guest is 96 years old, going strong, and recreated television in the 70s with a lot of shows. Norman Lear will be joining us. Then my friend, who is the president of Carson Productions, Jeff Sotzig, will be here. We're going to talk about the good old days of The Tonight Show with Johnny and Ed. Next hour, my buddy Amazing Kreskin will be here to amaze us. Then we're going to talk to the co-host of American Ninja Warriors. He's been with us several times in the past. Agmar Bajamiamela. And then we'll be chatting with Janelle Taylor about how to have your children use cell phones. And that's all coming up this week with Ron Seji Today. We'll be right back with legendary producer Norman Lear. Welcome to Tax Talk with Hollywood legend Bob Eubanks. You know, as part of Hollywood for a long time, I've seen my fair share of celebrities get in trouble with the IRS. Well, there's one name I trust, the Tax Defense Group. They're the most trusted name in tax. So if you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS, you really need to call my friends at the Tax Defense Group. Ignoring the IRS is not the solution. They can garnish your paycheck, levy your bank accounts, seize your home or business. But the Tax Defense Group could put a stop to all of that and tailor a program that would reduce your tax debt to pennies on the dollar. You gotta love that. So don't just take my word for it. Call them. Find out for yourself. They offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And they're open 24 hours a day because they know that tax debt doesn't sleep either. Call now for your free and confident tax analysis from the most trusted name in tax. Call 800-832-1594. 800-832-1594. This report is brought to you by Bank of America. Bank of America was recently named Best Bank for College Students by Money Magazine. With so many new and returning students preparing for the start of the school year in the weeks to come, it's critical to have the right bank account for student needs. April Schneider, Bank of America. It's very important to build a strong financial foundation early in adulthood. At Bank of America, we're committed to helping students start off on the right foot by providing them with best-in-class products like the Advantage Safe Balance Banking Account, along with educational resources such as Better Money Habits. Bank of America's Advantage Safe Balance Banking Account allows students to bank without the worry of overdraft fees while providing them with full mobile access to their account. Eligible students under age 24 also don't pay a monthly maintenance fee. This account was named Best Student Account by Money Magazine and is used by over 1 million clients. For more, visit bankofamerica.com. That's bankofamerica.com. We're back all across the USA and around the world. It's Ron Seggi today. You know, I've been in this broadcasting business for over 50 years with 19,000 guests uh, that we've had on the show. But people ask me all the time, Who's your favorite guest? And I always say, it's not a big name. It's somebody who moves and shakes. And if they have a big name to go with it, but they make it happen, that's even better. That fits the description of our next guest. What a remarkable individual in this business. New York Times bestselling author and changed the landscape of American television in the 70s. Joining us right now with his new book, Even This I Get to Experience, is Norman Lear. Welcome to our show. Hi, Ron. Hi, Norman. How are you, my friend? If I had a complaint, it'd be an ingrate. Oh. No, I, I thank you very much. And, and, and as I listened to you with that introduction, I thought, <laughs> even this I get to experience. <laughs> even I, I couldn't this. be more grateful. Thanks. <laughs> well, I started to read the beginning, just preface of the book, and then I turned to chapter one. Then I chapter two. It's a great format, by the way. And I couldn't stop. This is a remarkable story about someone who's come from very humble and difficult decisions, early childhood like you did, to make it to where you are today. Was the book therapeutic to write, Norman? Because you bring back some memories, especially of your mom and dad, that were tough to remember. Yeah, it it was extremely therapeutic. And uh, it's amazing how at my age, uh, writing that book, how much I learned about my life and myself. And, um, you know, when we take the time to reflect on everything we've been through and everything we've learned, and, you know, especially if we're forced to talk about it uh, or write about it, it's amazing. I think it's true for all of us. It's hard to be a human being, and we all experience that difficulty differently. Uh, But it's, uh, you know, I think about it as the game of life. Mm -hmm. You 
know, we pay a lot of money for the hard games, the most competitive games, the most difficult ones. And this game is hard, too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we don't know the conclusion. And uh, and that's interesting. Yeah, that is that's a very valid point, too. I know you vacillated on this for a long time about writing it. And you really have written it warts and all. There's no question about that. And you learned something about you that we didn't know. For example, I was not aware of the fact that you were a veteran of 52 missions on a B-17 in Europe. And yes. and you know what I loved? And this is kind of crazy. I don't know where to start with all the questions I have. I could talk to you for days. But i got to tell you what I love is that aren't parents a unique commodity? You had one point were going to be in the first class of the Hall of Fame for the Television Academy. And you called your mom. Uh, yes. I love this. May I, I have to read this. She said, well, and you told her, you know, you're in there with the greats. I mean, David Sarnoff, William Paley, uh, Edward R. Merle, all of these fantastic people, Milton Berle, uh, Lucy Ball. Milton Berle, Lucy Ball. Yeah. And she says, she said, after you told her you were going to be in this, she says, well, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> How do you feel when you get a reaction like that from Except mom? Except with this inflection, uh, Ron. If that's what they want to do, who am I to say? Who am I to say? <laughs> <laughs> now, you were doing a lot of movies and stuff with Dean Martin, Vincent Price, Martha Ray, Hedda Harper, our dear lost friend, Andy Williams, Frank Sinatra. When you got on the scene with these shows that at the time seemed controversial, what kind of problems did you go through with the networks, with the general public, with shows like All in the Family? Never went through any real difficulty with the general public. Of course there were people who disagreed or didn't like or, you know. And that was uh, a reasonable amount of mail that was always, by the way, provoked a good conversation because I would answer as many letters as I could. And I had long conversations over a period of months and sometimes years the network was another thing, you know. We always live with an establishment that thinks it's under, that thinks it understands what's best for us, and uh, and it's not an establishment that takes that many chances. So you know, so I had a, a network to say this. <laughs> their favorite way of putting it was, "This will not fly in Des Moines," <laughs> or there will be a knee jerk reaction in the Bible Belt, and uh, and. That, that it was a, there was an easier reaction when it was provoked when other when there was a lot of press about the network wouldn't do this and I was saying yes we have to do it and there was sufficient press on that then there were organizations on the crazy right or religious organizations that joined with the network and said no he can't do this but the American people are so much wiser than they're given credit for. And uh, with Donald Trump right now, my version of why Donald Trump has been as important now, why why was he as important as he was for these months? Because uh, the American people were using Donald Trump uh, as, the, as their middle finger on the right hand. And they were saying to the, to the established enemy, well, take this. You know, or you know the expression that goes with that. Sure. Uh, they weren't thinking Donald Trump would. They wanted him for four or eight years as their president. They were saying, "This is what you earn, you establishment. You give us leaders like in our auto companies or our chemical companies or our political leadership, and uh, take this." Mm-hmm. You know, when you get bad press, like, let's say, critical press, like you did with some of the shows, and especially All in the Family, because that was the groundbreaker, is those negative reviews, Norman, got to be, way down deep inside, a great thing. I mean, look what it did for Elvis when he first started. You know, everybody wanted to go see him in <laughs> yes. concert because they wanted to see the rest of his body. It's like when you go past a wreck, you want to look, but you don't want to look. You know, you got All in the Family, you're getting all of these uh, reviews that maybe aren't as complimentary as maybe the Dick Van Dyke got. And then you turn around and say, I'm going to watch that because what's this all about? I mean, was that the case? Well, the uh, yeah, the reviews were pretty bad. The New York Times ran a uh, ran a long article, a really long article, by uh, the woman who wrote Gentleman's Agreement, Laura Hobson, 
wonderful writer. She wrote a major tome with uh, Gentleman's Agreement about anti-Semitism. And so she was, a, you know, known to be a great, had great attitudes and, and, and smarts about racial and religious issues and so forth. And she just loathed the show. The, she was writing about the first and second episodes when she wrote this piece. Uh, but they allowed me to answer her. And uh, I love one line in my answer. I, I, I said, the way she expressed herself about the show and the way I felt were so different that uh, she had to be somebody about my age. And I said, we were aging in, in different wine cellars. <laughs> 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 great line, great line. I find it, in business myself, I find it very difficult to juggle a lot of things at one time. Here you're juggling nine shows on the air at one time. It had to be a, a very busy time, exciting time. But you know, little things, and this is what I loved about the book, little things. I mean, like I said before, you have warts and all. The word stifle, which of course was, you know, like a phrase that was synonymous with Archie Bunker, was a word your dad used. Yes, Jeanette Stifle. Yeah, yeah, Jeanette I can, see, I can see his nose next to hers as he was screaming in her face. Yeah. And a comment he made when you were so happy that you were getting like 350 or $400 a week writing for Danny Thomas, he said, when you make $1,000 a week, then that's a lot of money. I mean, th these are tough things right. to accept as a young man. <laughs> and, and what was so foolish and funny about that was that you know, he he never got close to making three hundred dollars a week. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he was always going to have a million dollars soon. <laughs> you referred to him as Arthur Miller's Willie Loman, didn't you? Yes, in the sense that uh, the one thing he did was, no matter what the odds were that seemed against him, he got up in the morning and his lust for life was so full, and he left the house with a shoe shine and a smile like Willie Loman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it was ridiculous that he thought he was going to be wealthy very quickly with one scheme after another. But uh, but I loved the zest. And that in itself is a great incentive. The man himself who changed television in the 70s, all of his shows were hits. All in the Family, Maud, Good Times, The Jeffersons, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and the list goes on. An unbelievable producer of unique television shows that absolutely changed how people watch television and the subject matter. And that man is our guest, and we will come back with another segment with Norman Lear. As a mother, you don't want to have to worry about this bill is coming, but then she needs this chemo. That's a decision you shouldn't have to make. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. The treatment doesn't get any better than what you receive at St. Jude. It saved my life. It saved my daughter's life. It saved our family. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. As a mother, you don't want to have to worry about this bill is coming, but then she needs this chemo. That's a decision you shouldn't have to make. It's a huge burden lifted financially, and so it allows you to give singular focus to your child. I've never known a hospital that takes care of their patients so thoroughly. That was the first thing I was like, how are we going to do this? When they told us that we didn't have to pay a single bill, I was like, wow. They pretty much have saved us. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. And now your focus is supporting this child. There is not another hospital like St. Jude. The patient care is unmatchable. It saved my life. It saved my daughter's life. It saved our family. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. It's pretty amazing when you consider that seven years ago, we didn't have the treatments we have now. We cure 80% of children with cancer. Go back 50 years, we were curing 20 to 30%. This is the miracle story of modern medicine. We understand what makes this cancer tick. And of course, without donors from around the world, this just couldn't happen. And there's one thing we're focused on, and that's beating this thing. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org.
It is a horrible scenario, but it happens. Dennis writes about his wife. She was diagnosed with leukemia. In fact, she's a two-time survivor. And in the midst of all that, they ran up over a million dollars in medical bills. Thankfully, they're MediShare members. And Dennis says they are so thankful for that, how others came together to meet their needs. And that's how so many MediShare members feel. This is not health insurance. It's different. You don't have to pay for things you don't believe in. And like Dennis found out, it just works. So if you join MediShare, not only do you save a lot of money, the typical family saves about 500 bucks a month, but you know where your money's going each month. You're helping people. And if the time should come, they'll be helping and even praying for you. So yes, it's different. And as more than 400,000 people now know when it comes to healthcare costs, different is beautiful. Find out more. Call 833 34 Bible. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Welcome back. It's Ron Seggi today. My guest is probably one of the most successful television producers of all time. He absolutely changed television during the 70s with his shows. Shows like All in the Family, Maud, Good Times, The Jeffersons, and Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I mean, it was a different world then because this was the first time that television addressed topics that were very sensitive to the general public. He got a lot of criticism for it at first, but then it became a trend that took him to the top of the charts just about every week with all of those shows. They were all in the top 10 shows. That's an unbelievable feat by our guest, Norman Lear. And Norman, I want to apologize, Norman, because in the beginning of the book, there is a list of all of the things that you have done, including a tour of China with writers and producers of Hollywood segment and, you know, your great stays with the presidents and your associations and being on President Nixon's enemy list, even though I think sometimes uh, you had a great shot at promoting him with Archie Bunker loving him the way he did and all of the accomplishments that you've had in a lifetime, which I assume is how you got to the title, even this I get to experience, because after so many decades in this business, you're still a very prevalent and respected individual. That's a tough thing to accomplish in television, and you know that better than anyone in the world would know that. Well, it's, you know, there's it, there are two words that, uh, small words, that are much more important than we, uh, in the nature of things, give them credit for. And those words are over and next. And uh, when something is over, it is over, and we're on to next. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I kind of found that a long time ago. And, And the hammock in the middle, if there was a hammock between over and next, that would be where living in the moment is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I looked forward to this interview. Well, I appreciate Because it was my next. And, uh, and, and, and I think of it truly as even this I get to experience. Because it took me 93 years, a bunch of uh, months and days and weeks and, and minutes to get to this interview. It took you all your life to get to this moment with me, too. And uh, thinking it about it that way just knocks me out. Oh, my gosh. I, I got the chills when you said that. Absolutely. I know you're on a very busy schedule, Norman. I would love to have you come back anytime you wanted. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you my Barbara Walters question, what I hate to do, but I, I just got to I gotta do this. The Barbara Walters question? My Barbara Walters yes. question. So don't break down and cry on me, okay? What would you like to be remembered for? A hundred years from now, you and I are finally gone. A hundred years, okay, because hopefully it's going to be a long time before, you know, either one of us leave the scene. What do you want to be remembered for? It, How do people want to look back I on If I were remembered for what I just spoke about, I'd be very happy. Ah. I, you know, call it the hammock in the middle. Call it living in the moment. Call it understanding that you matter because you are talking to somebody, you are relating to somebody there's somebody looking at you that gets something from it in every moment uh living in the moment if i could be remembered for this conversation i'd be i'd be happy uh well how sweet of you to say that you're the best norman you really are the book is out right oh, now thank you. a new york times best-selling book that's in paperback norman lear's pendant i love the title you may not get the title when you read it on a bookshelf that's why you got to take it home and read it, and then you'll understand. Even this I get to experience by the genius of Norman Lear. 
Norman, anytime. Ryan, I couldn't appreciate it more. Thank you. Thank you. And anytime you want to come back, at a moment's notice, we'd love to have you, my friend. I'm going to take you up on it. I hope you do. Thank you, Norman. I'll be back. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank I you, will. sir. Thanks, Bye. Norman. Our very special guest, Norman Lear. I mean, how much better can it get than that? I mean, the man is like Mr. Television. He's had so many successful television shows that his record has never been equaled. I want to drop in here for a moment to talk about a subject that is very near and dear to me. I've had a very good association with Cleveland's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame over the years, and in fact, we have broadcasted from that facility on several different occasions. But I saw an article come across my desk the other day, which was penned by a gentleman by the name of Barry Levin. I want to give him credit for that because the article was outstanding, and it addressed a concern that us rock and roll fans have had for years over the musicians inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And let me just kind of paraphrase what he said in this article because it is so true. He says, congratulations to officials at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum for again embarrassing themselves with the nominees for induction into the Shrine. Certainly some of the nominees merit induction. Chicago and Janet Jackson should have been inducted years ago. Chicago had 30 top 40 hits. Jackson had 29 top 40 hits. However... Other nominees merited strong consideration. The Cars, Deep Purple, Steve Miller Band, and The Spinners. The shame of all this is that so many pre-Beatles stars continue to be ignored. Was Paul Anka with 30 top 40 hits and one number one record nominated? No. Was Frankie Avalon with 13 top 40 hits and a pair of number ones nominated? No. Was Chubby Checker? Mr. Twist, with 23 top 40 hits, three consecutive chart toppers nominated, and the number one song for two years in a row, and he is very upset about this, I've talked to him about that, no, was Connie Francis, another one of our friends upset with this, with 35 top 40 hits and three number ones nominated, ever inducted, no, was Johnny Maestro, who had top 10 hits as lead singer with The Crest and The Brooklyn Bridge ever nominated? No. Was Johnny Mathis, with 20 top 40 hits and two chart toppers nominated? No. Was Bobby Rydell, with 19 top 40 hits and a pair of number ones nominated? No way. Was Neil Sedaka, with 21 top 40 hits and three that reached number one nominated? No. Even post-Beatle performers like Bon Jovi, Whitney Houston, continue to be ignored by the nominating committee. Also receiving nominations were Sheik, Cheap Trick, JB's, Chaka Khan, Los Lobros, Nine Inch Nails, NBA, The Smiths, and Yes. Some of these groups never had one top 40 hit. Do you think rock and roll would be the same without the contributions of Paul Anka, Frankie Evalon, Chubby Checker, Connie Francis, Johnny Maestro, Johnny Mathis, Bobby Rydell, Neil Sedaka? The answer is a resounding no. So why are their accomplishments continually ignored? I wish I had the answer, my friends, but I don't. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum will never be a true Hall of Fame until it starts to recognize the genre's early superstars. By ignoring these rock stars would be the same as if the Baseball Hall of Fame ignored Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, Cy Young, and what they did for Major League Baseball. It just would not be the Hall of Fame. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame never will be recognized as a real Hall of Fame of rock and roll until early artists get the recognition they deserve. Thank you, Barry Levine, for that very fine article, and we wanted to pass along to our listeners its content. Come on, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Get your act together. There's more to come with Ron Sedgy today. You know, some things you just don't get tired of. That music and what that music indicated was coming up. And that's The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And we have a very special guest on our show right now. It's a gentleman who was responsible for putting Johnny Carson back on DVD long after he has passed away. And something has happened in the media business that really for once is going my way. I've been waiting for this for a long, long time as millions of others And that is the fact that more video is now going to be available of the great Johnny Carson. Joining us right now is a gentleman very close to him, president of Carson Entertainment. And he also is the nephew of Johnny Carson. Joining us is Jeff Sotzing. Hi, Jeff. How are you? 
Hi, Ron. I'm fine. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for being here. And I've got to tell you something. Me, like millions of Americans, not only across the country but around the world, miss your uncle. And I know you hear that every single day, as we did when I was with Ed touring the country with the memories of The Tonight Show. Oh, that's that's wonderful to hear. I appreciate that. And uh, I went on the website now, johnnycarson.com. This is unbelievable. Tell us about what you have done that have made this big news for everybody in the entertainment business. Well, the thing that makes this really unique is the, is the fact that the entire library is now searchable. Uh, it was recorded on two-inch videotape originally, and then one-inch videotape, transferred to uh, Beta SP, and... Uh, in the process of trying to preserve the library recently, we had the idea if, uh, if we could tie a transcription to the video, then you'd be able to type in a phrase or an individual and find it immediately. And that's what we've done. It's great. You cannot believe how many emails I've gotten in the last 24 hours telling me to go to this site because they know what a big fan I was of the show. Uh -huh. And the amazing part about it is, is that this morning I'm watching all these clips and my assistant comes in and says, what are you doing? And I said, <laughs> I says, for once in my life, I am starting my day off right. What, are you kidding me? <laughs> now, there's also another site called licensing.johnnycarson.com. Tell us about that. Well, the, the site is really two sites. It's a, it's a home video DVD site with selected segments and individual shows that are for sale to the public. And the clip licensing site is really for the broadcast media. And the clip licensing site enables uh, industry professionals to go through the site and search and license clips. At the moment, it's not available to the general public for uh, just for entertaining uh, viewing, but it will be within the next month or so. It's going to happen very quickly. Now, this is a gold mine, and speaking about a gold mine, it actually was stored in a mine, wasn't it? It was stored in a salt mine in Kansas. It's all sto stored in Hutchinson, Kansas, in a salt mine 230 feet below the surface, uh, constant air temperature, constant humidity, fireproof. Floodproof. It's just, it's, it's a fascinating facility. I've gone out there and, and seen it. Now, you were born in Philadelphia. I was a Pennsylvania boy, so we have something in common. Moved out to okay. California. And then you just took, like, summer jobs answering the phones and the Tonight Show uh, and when it was in Burbank. And you went on to be a production assistant, then an associate producer, <laughs> then won an Emmy in 1992 for the right. Bette Miller Robin Williams show, which was fantastic. And then president of Carson Productions and very close to your uncle. Yeah, I, you know, I was really fortunate. You know, he not only was me, his, he was my uh, employer uh, and my uncle, he, he was my friend. And we shared a lot of great moments together, and I had a tremendous respect for the work that he did and, and worked very hard to preserve it. And now to make it accessible is, uh, is something that I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of. Well, i tell you something. You have made a portion of my life very, very happy, not only doing this, but when you uh, permitted Ed to use some of those clips in our stage show, Ed thought the world of you. i got to tell you that, Jeff. He, he never wanted to do anything unless he checked with you, especially after the passing of your uncle. Well, he was, he was very nice in, the, in the, that regard. He did not need to do that, but he would call me from time to time and say, I'm going to play at this theater, or I want to do this type of production, can we use this? And I said, yeah, you know, of, of course. It's, he's such a big part of the show. Uh, he could do whatever he wanted. Yes. What's amazing is that uh, the morning that you called him to tell him of your uncle's death, the first call he made was to me, and I didn't take the call because I thought he might have been dialing the wrong number because there's three hours difference, and it was so early. So exactly. I waited about an hour, and I called him back, and I said, what, did you dial wrong? And then he told me, of course, the very, very sad news. Let's talk about the tapes that were from 1962 when NBC owned the show. What happened to those? Because I heard a story, well, he told me one time, the fact that those tapes were actually not knowing that the show was going to go on to be what it was for 30 years and huge even afterwards, that... NBC used to tape over the earlier tapes? They didn't think that they were worth anything? No, exactly. I mean, at that time, there were no home video. There was no uh, syndication, no cable. And uh, tape was expensive. It was a few hundred dollars per night in the 60s. So uh, when The Tonight Show moved to New York, I mean, moved from New York to Los Angeles in 1972, they decided to uh, do an anniversary special, a compilation show, and it realized that the first 10 years of the show were gone, and no one could figure out where they went. And if you go back to these old original reels, and you look inside the reel, there's a pass sheet, and it says, Tonight Show, 1964, Tonight Show, 1966, NBC Nightly News, 1968, Hullabaloo, Shindig, and then the last show, and it's, that's where it went. 
Now, did they preserve the one, the first one with Groucho Marx and everything? You know, it, they did not. But fortunately, uh, a viewer recorded the audio from that show and sent it to Johnny years ago, and uh, we do have that. It's not on our site, but I do have a copy of that. Well, and it's a shame, too, because there were a lot of classic shows. There were some black and white shows out of New York that were taped, apparently, as you alluded to, because I remember him doing a little dance with, was it Ella Fitzgerald? Ah, uh, that was with... Uh, Della Reese. No, not Della no, Reese. Della Reese, somebody... I'm going to... <laughs> well, Louis we, Belson's wife. Who was Louis Belson's L- wife? Louis Belson's wife. That's exactly right. And I can't remember that. I can't remember that. Pearl Bailey. Pearl Bailey. There you go. There you and, go. And what, what the, the kinescopes is what those are. Those were actually the negatives oh. that were made as a, a copy for guests. And in the 60s, if you wanted to have a copy of your performance from The Tonight Show, you had a film made of the segment, and then you threaded up your film projector and you played it against the wall, if you can believe that. Yeah, no, I remember. I remember people doing that. Now, Jeff, the last time we talked, I mentioned to you the fact that I thought that it would be a unique idea for a cable channel to air Johnny's Tonight Show against today's Tonight Show at the same time. And since the last time we spoke, they have done that. Antenna TV, which is part of a cable franchise that I think Spectrum carries, airs it every night, 11.30 Eastern Time. I watch that show every evening. It's the hour show Monday through Friday, and then the hour and a half show on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm sure that the reason more people are not watching it is because there's probably not that many people that are aware of that cable channel. And if they were, the show would be huge again. Well, I think the the audience is very fragmented now, and uh, that's that's pretty dated material. And we've been off the air, so you're you're going to look at material that's generally 25 years old, 30 years old. I think Johnny, if he was alive, would say, hey, I already did it, and I went away on top, and that's the way I'm going to stay. Oh, I- that's exactly right. Jeff Satsing is our guest. He is the president of Carson Entertainment. JohnnyCarson.com is where you have to go. It's a brand new addition to 30 years of the great Tonight Show with the giant, the king, Johnny Carson. Today was the first meeting back in Washington of President Carter and the president-elect Ronald Reagan. They met in the Oval Office, and uh, the bad news was that the two of them together couldn't figure out why bread is a dollar a loaf. (laughs) That was just kind of a, uh, what you call an economy joke. Economy? And what? No, no. Yes, yes, it was. Economy laugh. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to give me a small economy announcer, too. (laughs) You know, they, they, they... They come in smaller sizes, you know. (laughs) When you get a shot, for some reason, they don't give it to you in the arm. They give it to you, as you know. I guess, why do they do that? I don't know. What are you looking at me for? I'm not a doctor. (laughs) Well, no, but I mean, when you get a shot, you don't get it in the arm. You usually get it in the uh, the gluteus maximus. Yes. I guess, in that area. There's more of that than there is of your arm. (laughs) Certainly is of yours. (laughs) (laughs) You brought it up. I know. I uh... Uh, you know who's coming out of retirement? Said he wasn't going to come out of retirement? Muhammad Ali said he is coming out of retirement again. But he's going to fight again. The reason he is coming out of retirement, he needs $2 million for his divorce settlement. <laughs> then his wife is going to retire undefeated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This is a beautiful weekend out here. Lovely. I mean, absolutely great in Southern California. Uh, yesterday in Malibu, it was so hot that George Hamilton's sun reflector burned a hole in a Goodyear blimp. Went down like a... <laughs> I uh, saved a life this morning. Oh. Japanese tourists got hung up on my electric fence, and I turned the power down to simmer. <laughs> It is a horrible scenario, but it happens. Dennis writes about his wife. She was diagnosed with leukemia. In fact, she's a two-time survivor. And in the midst of all that, they ran up over a million dollars in medical bills. Thankfully, they're MediShare members. And Dennis says they are so thankful for that, how others came together to meet their needs. And that's how so many MediShare members feel. This is not health insurance. It's different. You don't have to pay for things you don't believe in. And like Dennis found out, it just works. So if you join MediShare, not only do you save a lot of money, the typical family saves about 500 bucks a month, but you know where your money's going each month. You're helping people. And if the time should come, they'll be helping and even praying for you. So yes, it's different. And as more than 400,000 people now know when it comes to healthcare costs, different is beautiful. Find out more. Call 833 34 
833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. You sound good tonight. Yeah. Yeah, last night we had a lowbrow. Well, I shouldn't say that. Oh, they're gone. Why not? It was a... Kind of a low... Looked out during the monologue, and a lady in the third row was waxing her legs with mop and glow. It's Ron Seggi today. I've been in the broadcasting business now almost seven decades, but a man who surpassed broadcasting expectations far as length of time was concerned was Johnny Carson, who was on The Tonight Show for 30 years, in addition to four years before that on Who Do You Trust? And then, of course, writing for Red Skelton and being very close with Jack Benny. Joining us right now is the nephew and the president of Carson Entertainment, Jeff Sutzing. And Jeff is uh, talking about johnnycarson.com, where you can go now and get all these great clips. And, of course, they're still going to have the series of DVD releases, too, right, Jeff? That's right, Ron. I'm sure that you've been asked this a million times, but your uncle was a very private person, wasn't he? Yep, very and much so. He really, around small crowds, didn't shine like he did when he was in front of 10 million people. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I think that he was uncomfortable in a crowd. Yeah. He was, he was, he was a, uh, a genuinely funny guy, though. Yeah, something that amazed me, and I was just talking to one of the people from Graceland just the other day, is when you go down into the recreation room of Elvis Presley's home in Memphis, Tennessee, he has three televisions there. Right. And all three televisions, he got this idea from LBJ, apparently, all three TVs are running the best of The Tonight Show. How funny is that? Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I mentioned it to my friend, the late Joe Esposito, whether that really happened or not. He said, oh, boy, he watched Johnny Carson every night. He wouldn't miss it, you know, unless he was on tour or something. And on all three of those videos is the Tonight Show the best of. It's, it's unbelievable. Oh, that's interesting. I love that. Ah. Well, you know, it's, it's such, uh, it's Americana. It, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is what people relate to at 1130 at night for so many years. Yes, and almost camped off a day of tension, whether you were in business, or school, whatever the case may be. It was just a light way to go to bed. And the fact that he was able to do that right. and not have, of course, times have changed, but any direction of blue humor was amazing. I mean, listening to these clips that were playing on the show, he'd just take it up to the envelope and then know where to stop. Oh, he knew exactly where to stop. He, he, he had a great sense of, uh, of the middle of the road and uh, how to not offend people. He, 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 was, he was, had a, a terrific uh, comedic sense. Mm -hmm. Now, like he, you are a pilot, right? I am. What do you fly, by the way, because I'm kind of interested in airplanes. I have uh, a Cessna 182. Oh, do you really? Uh-huh. It's a new airplane, and uh, my wife and I fly it all over the country. We love it. Oh, wow. Do you ever come down to Orlando? Uh, you know, I haven't been to south, but I actually want to go uh, to the uh, Bahamas, and uh, I w I'd love to go to Orlando. Well, you need to stop over here and be our guest, you and your wife. Speaking about uh, the Orlando area and the Florida area, I know you're... Uncle had a boat down here every once in a while. What about the two sons? What are they doing right now? Um, he has a son who lives in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and he has another son who lives in um, in Florida. I'm not sure exactly where, but near Orlando. N near, I think it's in the Fort Lauderdale area, isn't it? Back Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did he miss leaving the spotlight because Ed told me many times that he just didn't miss being in the spotlight anymore because he said, I did it. I, I kind of got the impression that NBC wanted him to be the elder statesman, much like Bob Hope was, but he just didn't want to do it anymore. You know, I think he, he really missed being in the spotlight, but he felt that there was a time to go, and he didn't want to be someone who had stayed too long. And the fact that uh, people would stop him on the street and say to him, we miss you so much, there's nobody like you, he would then say to me that you can't get any better than that. I'm not going to screw that up. No, and that's absolutely the case. Timing in comedy is everything, and he knew what to do in his career as far as timing was concerned, and he did it with graces, which you know, he did 30 years of television with. Now, typing in a single name, word, or phrase into a search engine, a producer or anyone could really thumbnail any term or clip or guest that they want, can't they? Well, again, I need to make it clear that that's not for the, the the public at the moment. That's for the for the broadcast industry. But yes, you can you could type in uh, Ronald Reagan, and uh, not only do you see the times that he appeared on the show. I think it was when he was the governor of the California. Right. But you also see any time that someone mentioned Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and it's 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 fascinating. And uh, within a month. That will be available to the public. The, uh, there, there's, there's been a, a jump on the fact that that is part of the clip licensing site, and that is 
really a wonderful feature. There's a lot of the clips that we remember were in movies like Fargo, Talk to Me, Watchmen. I mean, you must get, I would imagine, that you are just inundated year after year with people wanting to use these clips for different things. And I congratulate you on being very specific on who you give these things to because they are chunks of gold. Well, they are, and, and the way that uh, they use the segments of the show and, and talk to me was, was, a, was a great reflection of uh, the way the show looked in, in uh, New York. It was flattering, and uh, I love to see the, the show used like that. It's terrific. Yeah, it really, it's used with respect and dignity, which is the way it should be used. What do you think your uncle would have said about the fiasco over The Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien and the fact that The Tonight Show was brought back to New York starring Jimmy Fallon where it all started going back to when Steve Allen was hosting it back in the late 50s. Oh, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that he would have a whole ear for me, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what that would be. But he would, he would find that very interesting. Well, I think he would, too. Well, yes. i got to tell you something, Jeff. I uh, take this as an immense compliment that you joined us on the show today. I really do. I have to be honest. I've been in the broadcasting business a long time. I have never said this to anyone. Uh, not even the pals of Elvis Presley, okay? But I envy you. I envy you that you were close to such a magnificent performer and such a legend as Johnny Carson because, and I told that to Ed, too. I said uh, that to be in his presence had to be a real trip. Well, that's very nice, Ron. And yeah, I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. I was able to stand very close to the uh, a, a guy who was, was at the top of his profession. It was great. It was wonderful. He was literally the best. And that Midwestern smile, that innocent boy look, and that very quick mind made it all 100% Johnny Carson. True, true. Okay, the website is johnnycarson.com. Go to it now. It is terrific. And our guest has been the president of Carson Entertainment, and that is Johnny's nephew, Jeff Sotsing. Jeff, thank you so much, and please take me up on my invitation to stop down here and visit us, okay? I will do that, Ron. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you, my friend. Okay, bye-bye. Let's enjoy some of Johnny's bits right now. It's kind of a sad, I hate to bring sad, but, you know, it's my job to report what's going on in the country. (laughs) And a a man who visits this show very frequently, one of my favorite guests, was in the paper today, Dr. Carl Sagan, the world-famed astronomer, after 12 years, is getting divorced from his wife. Now, I hate to hear things like that. And that's possible that's going to cost him billions and billions (laughs) of dollars. Look, there are a lot of things to do here in Burbank. A lot of fascinating sights. Have you been up to the Vista Point on Mulholland Drive? Oh. Vista Point, Mulholland. You drive up there, you give a quarter to a valley girl. She lets you look in her ear. And out the other ear, you can see the entire San Fernando Valley. <laughs> As a mother, you don't want to have to worry about this bill is coming, but then she needs this chemo. That's a decision you shouldn't have to make. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. The treatment doesn't get any better than what you receive at St. Jude. It saved my life. It saved my daughter's life. It saved our family. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. As a mother, you don't want to have to worry about this bill is coming, but then she needs this chemo. That's a decision you shouldn't have to make. It's a huge burden lifted financially, and so it allows you to give singular focus to your child. I've never known a hospital that takes care of their patients so thoroughly. That was the first thing I was like, how are we going to do this? When they told us that we didn't have to pay a single bill, I was like, wow. They pretty much have saved us. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders, and now your focus is supporting this child. There is not another hospital like St. Jude. The patient care is unmatchable. It saved my life. It saved my daughter's life. It saved our family. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures. Saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. It's pretty amazing when you consider that seven years ago, we didn't have the treatments we have now. We cure 80% of children with cancer. Go back 50 years, we were curing 20 to 30%. This is the miracle story of modern medicine. We understand what makes this cancer tick. And of course, without donors from around the world, this just couldn't happen. There's one thing we're focused on, and that's beating this thing. 
St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. It is a horrible scenario, but it happens. Dennis writes about his wife. She was diagnosed with leukemia. In fact, she's a two-time survivor. And in the midst of all that, they ran up over a million dollars in medical bills. Thankfully, they're MediShare members. And Dennis says they are so thankful for that, how others came together to meet their needs. And that's how so many MediShare members feel. This is not health insurance. It's different. You don't have to pay for things you don't believe in. And like Dennis found out, it just works. So if you join MediShare, not only do you save a lot of money, the typical family saves about 500 bucks a month, but you know where your money's going each month. You're helping people. And if the time should come, they'll be helping and even praying for you. So yes, it's different. And as more than 400,000 people now know when it comes to healthcare costs, different is beautiful. Find out more. Call 833 34 Bible. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. That's going to wrap up hour number one of Ron Seggi today, but we have another hour to go. I want to thank my guests who joined me this first hour, and they include 96-year-old Norman Lear, a legend in television, no question about it, and also my friend, the president of Johnny Carson Productions, Jeff Sotzik, bringing back some great memories of The Tonight Show with Johnny and Ed. Next hour, the amazing Kreskin. I've known Kreskin probably over 45 years. Then, from American Ninja Warriors, it's Agbar Bajamia Mila and Janelle Taylor. We're going to talk about children and cell phones. And that's all coming up next hour live with Ron Seji today. We're going to pause. My first guest in the second hour will be the amazing Kreskin. (laughs) 